Chatfuel School is now in session. Welcome to our live one-hour class every Wednesday, where the Chatfuel team and the top experts in the industry will cover the most important topics you need to know as a chatbot builder and marketer. I'm Andrew, Chatfuel's head of video production. And I'm Yelena, Chatfuel's key account manager. So recently I graduated from college and back when I was on campus, I lived just across the street from my university president. He lived in this big, beautiful, gorgeous house, one that anyone, anyone could dream of or that any university president has. And it made me wonder, you know, what's the real value of what university presidents do? You know, why do they get paid so much? Why do they have all these nice things? And the answer that I found is that one big responsibility that these presidents have is, of course, fundraising, getting people to give money to the school. So, yes, they get paid a lot, but they also bring a lot to the school. And unlike traditional donation campaigns, they don't just send out, you know, mass mailers or make mass phone calls. Instead, what they do is they travel, right? They physically go to meet up with these potential donors. They wine and dine them. And it's all about having a good time. And really what it boils down to is the fact that university presidents, the value they bring to the table is their ability to have meaningful conversations, in this case with donors. That conversation, of course, can be the difference between whether somebody donates to the school or doesn't. And you might be asking, well, Andrew, what the heck does this have to do with nonprofits and bots for good? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Nonprofits can, and many do, use this same framework, right? They have conversations with people, and those conversations can have a meaningful impact. They can tell someone about the mission of the nonprofit and get them to donate, or even if the person doesn't donate, it at least raises brand awareness about that nonprofit. So as I mentioned, that's our topic of conversation today, nonprofits using and having conversations, but not only having conversations, it's all about scaling up those conversations to create more of an impact. And that's what we'll talk about today with messenger bots and chat fields. So super excited to have these two nonprofits with us today. But before we introduce each of the representatives from them, Yelena, I know you have a question for our audience. Yes, thank you for the story, Andrew. Uh, I actually, um, I'm so excited because for the first time we have uh, two guests and it's on such an important topic. Um, so guys, uh, you can tell us uh, in the chat. Hi guys, you can tell us in the chat, what's your favorite nonprofit and why? Uh, I am actually very, very partial there uh, because um, my favorite nonprofits are student organizations, uh, as I've been in one for a couple of years during university, and it has been one of the best experiences where I got a lot of work-related experience, a lot of connections, and all sorts of things, while at the same time um, doing projects and making positive impact. So yes, please tell us in the comments, and we're going to read a few of the most interesting ones. In the meantime, I will introduce one of our guests, our first guest, again, as Yelena said, super excited to have two people on this afternoon or evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. So our first guest is Tony. He's from an organization called Direct Relief. And Tony here is the VP, the Vice President of Communications at Direct Relief. And in case you don't know, Direct Relief is a nonprofit, obviously. It's an international organization that provides supplies and different medical aid to vulnerable communities. And I Pulled this quote from their website that I love. They do all of this, quote, without regard to politics, religion, or ability to pay, which is super refreshing. Love to hear that. And it's amazing. And one fun fact about Direct Relief that you probably don't know is that the organization was actually founded by an Estonian immigrant uh, during World War II. So, Tony, great to have you. Thanks for having me. Great. Yes. Our second guest is Raul from Cars from Kids, which is a Texas nonprofit. Uh, and despite how it might sound, they do not donate cars to kids. That was my first uh, thought. Uh, they actually organize uh, auctions and auction off cars and then donate the proceeds uh, to schools. However, they do get quite a few questions from kids who would like to have a vehicle. Uh, so kids, please don't message them. But that's not how that works. Uh, welcome, Raul. Uh, can you please tell us what's the craziest vehicle someone donated? And we do, we do get pleasure being here. We do get that question a lot. And uh, a few years ago, we actually 
uh, received a donated Bentley limousine. Wow, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. I bet the kids were happy. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Those proceeds did impact thousands of kids in Texas. Awesome. Good deal, good deal. So great, uh, again, great to have both of you here. Super excited for this conversation. So to kick things off, uh, Tony, I'll direct this first question to you. Um, just tell us briefly to kind of set the stage for our audience now that we know what your nonprofit does. Um, tell us just briefly, um, how are you currently using ChatFuel? I understand it's kind of to automate uh, inquiries that you're getting. That's right. So particularly during emergencies, direct relief gets uh, experiences pretty high spikes in interest and in inquiries, people wanting to know whether we're responding to a particular part of the world, um, what our response entails. We also have a lot of um, inquiries from people around the world who need help. Uh, this can be organizations that um, you know, want to enroll to get free medications or funding support from direct relief or individuals who, uh, you know, are in a tough spot and need a helping hand. So um, fortunately, we work with Chat Fuel uh, and are able to automate a lot of that process. It just would be untenable for us to do this all manually. Um, we actually found ourselves in that position during the 2017 hurricane season with Harvey and Irma and Maria. Um, where we were kind of at this uh, crossroads. We either need to hire probably 10 customer service representatives or figure out a way to work smarter. Um, and that's when Facebook recommended we check out ChatFuel. And, uh, you know, in a, in a few nights, we were able to get a prototype out that, that really alleviated the, um, the workload. So uh, we've been using it ever since, iterating along the way. Um, and we, we really use it as kind of a customer service um, buffer and also built into it, you know, the ability to elevate certain things that require a human. Um, we'd love to be able to talk to every single person, but uh, it's just not possible sometimes. Yeah, and I think it's a really cool contrast too, because we have you, Tony, who has you know used Chatfield, built this bot for like three years now, and then we have you, Raul, who just started you know a couple of weeks ago. So um, to ask that same question to you that I just asked to Tony, Raul, uh, tell us just briefly again how you're using Chatfield for Cars for Kids. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the great things that we take pride in at Texans Scan Cars for Kids is that we host everything in-house. So there's three different components of the organization. There's the donation component. Then we also host our in-house auction. And we also, uh, um, in order to, we also host uh, a portion of that where people are able to sell their vehicles at our auction. So we have multiple different ways that people can engage with us. So in order to help automate some of the process and inquiries using uh, Facebook, we are using the chatbot to be able to see how we can render help to the user, whether it's, are they interested in donating a vehicle and being able to be responsive? Uh, one of the things that we were running in the past was that we were losing warm leads because of the time it took us for us to engage with that particular person. Um, also, if people are interested, they're not interested in donating, but they're interested in, the, interested in the auction component, then we're able to give them information regarding the auction immediately. And also, if people are interested in selling their car at the auction, because we also do a consignment program, we're able to give that information on the fly using the bot. And so we're able to take a lot of that manual labor out of the equation while still giving them the option in the end and chat fuel gives them the option to hand over the conversation to us, uh, the user can be presented with uh, information up front. So it removed a lot of those hurdles uh, that were time constraints. That's actually great because what both of you guys said is uh, boiling down to uh, building those relationships and being faster and saving resources. And I think it's a common misconception that people think that's something just, you know, businesses that are for profit need to do and need to engage in and have that type of, those types of tools in their uh, marketing arsenal. But it's actually, it couldn't be further uh, away from the truth as, as we can see. Um, so let's go a bit deeper into the results and impact and all, all those things. So uh, Tony, could you share with us a little bit about um, the results you have um, or the impact that using a, a bot has had on your organization so far? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we went from just, again, going back to 2017, before we had the bot, uh, it was very manageable, the amount of inquiries we would get. Um, 
asking various questions about our organization. Uh, you know, our response time was pretty quick, but once the hurricanes hit, um, we saw our response time slow to, you know, we couldn't, it was several days before we could get back to someone. And, you know, after instituting the bot, it went down to under a minute, which is incredible um, to what Raul said, you know, being quick, um, meeting someone's expectations, which have, you know, aren't, um, consumer expectations have grown so much and that extends to the charity space also despite the fact that charities often, um, you know, have fewer resources to put into technology systems. So I think, you know, for, an or for organizations that need to make sure that every single dollar goes as far as it can because it's given to somebody for, a, you know, to, to advance a cause they care about, I think that's even more important to find effective, efficient ways of, um, you know, solving problems. And Tony, that brings me to a, an interesting question too. You mentioned limited resources, and that's something we hear from a lot of nonprofits and charities out there. Um, and Raul, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but you know, you mentioned these limited resources, and some people come to us and say, you know, my charity, my nonprofit, like we simply don't have the budget for this, or it's you know outside of our resources to pay for chat fuel. So. I'm curious, you know, how you justify the the cost because I know earlier you said, you know, we could either like use the bot or hire, you know, more people to manage this. So, how do you kind of justify the uh, the cost of the service, even though you are, you know, a charity trying to, you know, maximize yeah. your limited resources? Well, it's funny. I mean, you know, there there were several meetings within the organization where I kind of floated the idea of a bot as the solution to this problem we were facing. And I think everyone just kind of said, you know, oh, it's it's that's beyond our um, in-house uh, expertise or capabilities. Um, so we re again, we reached out to Facebook. We asked them, like, you know, we're at a point where we either have to hire a lot of people we don't have funding for or turn off Messenger on Facebook, which is not the solution, you know, that, which isn't a good solution. And that's when they point us in the, the direction of chat fuel. And, you know, I, I and a colleague were able to... Um, in a few days create something that worked which you know kind of blew me away and i presented it to our team and the point of it was to show them that this is so much easier than we thought it would be um and i kind of held on to that idea and uh, we have a template now on the chat fuel uh, website for charities and part of the reason was i just want other people to realize that it's far easier than than it might appear from the outside to create something that works and that can save a charity resources. And another thing that was a a big uh, part of the decision process for us as a nonprofit, but not only as a nonprofit, but also as just a business in general, relationship is really important in culturing those relationships. And so we live in the prime era, if you will. People want instant and immediate gratification, instant answers, and so in order to be able to nurture those users on Facebook, we needed to be able to be responsive. And the best way to be responsive and render answers immediately to users was chat fuel. And I think that was a great solution for us to be able to provide and serve that data and information to the users, but also maintain that relationship with the users. Like these guys are very responsive, therefore validate how we uh, treat our donors at the same time. Yeah, our, our chat is actually getting uh, very lively and um, Tony, your background is getting all the praise. <laughs> and also, uh, we also we already have people who have uh, learned something from this session. So there's, Billy says, two things I've learned so far. Chatbots help nonprofits scale when they get a big spike in traffic, like in an emergency, and chatbots help organizations to be responsive, which matters to both don donors and volunteers. And I think that's actually completely correct um, when uh, when you take a look at what we've been talking about. Um, so let's uh, go to uh, Raul and a bit about the results and impact. I know you've been um, using the, the bot very shortly. And as Andrew mentioned, it's going to be interesting to compare uh, someone using uh, a bot for three weeks versus three years and like your, your guys' findings. Uh, but I know you've had um, a few, you've had an auction recently. So there are some things you can yeah, uh, absolutely. already share. I'd love, to, I'd love to elaborate. So we host a weekly auction of the vehicles that have been donated. And so a lot, and I, 
I'd like to say the majority of our Facebook traffic is actual uh, buyer's market. So uh, a lot of the Facebook presence that we have is also is to, to validate our donors, but also to drive traffic to buyers so that we can uh, run our auctions effectively. And one of the features that we found was very useful was the acquisition through comments. And so we have on average about 90 to 100,000 views per weekend on an auction. And so one of the things that we faced was that we were getting close to 700 to eight, seven to 800 comments per live stream. Wow, and that's so great engagement. We, it's excellent engagement, but we weren't able to keep up and answering all the questions that they had. So some people were trying to bid through Facebook and we know that you cannot bid through Facebook. And so we had to go one by one explaining to them how to get to the bidding portal, how to register and what it takes to register, et cetera. And so one of the great things about the bot was that it was able to see who was or who had an interest in the auction and then prompt a, a message immediately and asking the user, it looks like you're interested in the auction. And here are the steps that you can take to one, you know, you, had, you get an incentive for participating in the auction and two, here are the instructions on how you can bid. And so we were able to increase the uh, conversions rates from Facebook into our auction portal significantly and it's only been rolled out one week. And so Raul, you were just talking about the acquire users from comments feature, which is one of my favorites by far. I know I was, you know, doing the kind of onboarding call for you and showing you that, which was great to see you already, you know, getting value from it. Uh, Tony, what, what has been like the most useful chat fuel feature that you've found for direct relief? Again, just talking about the comment acquisition, you know, what, what is most useful for you? Is it just, you know, the general tools like, you know, buttons or the gallery cards or anything, you know, particularly special for direct relief? Yeah. I mean, I would say that all of the tools that allow me to do it without really a big technical background are, are huge. Um, also just, you know, the ability to fill out forms and have those feed into emails is, uh, is incredibly helpful because that then feeds into our kind of customer service, um, flow. Um, and lastly, you know, one feature that I really love is, is being able to offer folks a way to search our website and also to see our most recent articles. Cause what we use Facebook for primarily is in, uh, you know, an information tool. We share our updates. Um, it's kind of news driven. So having people be able to see our most recent stories um, is a way for them to see our most recent activity without having to update the bot every time. Uh, it's, you know, mm -hmm. feeds from our RSS feed. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I, also, I would like to, to <laughs> co-sign that statement because it does help a lot. The, the user experience on the chat bot without a heavy technical background is super critical. And that's something that as we learned how chat fuel works, that was really important for us. I mean, we, I mean, a lot, a lot of the consensus and maybe I'm wrong, but at least for us was that you needed a programmer to be involved and you needed somebody with heavy technology background to get this going. And, and chat fuel was very easy to, to set up. And I think after a few days and a lot of questions that we sent your way, we were able to, to get set up, but I mean, it, it was it was pretty seamless. Yeah, that's awesome. That's actually another misconception that you need a full technical team just to be able to have a simple bot, which is absolutely not true. Um, so that's very interesting because what Tony mentioned is like uh, you're using this chat bot for multiple purposes. Um, so how are you guys tracking the uh, success? Because you have uh, customer support, uh, you have all those different segments. Mm -hmm. um, how are you keeping up with, you know, what you're doing well and what you could be doing better? Yeah, you know, I think, um, well, so for us, when it's kind of a customer inquiry, the, the goal we found, the most important thing is to quickly get it into a, our main system for customer response. And, you know, we use routing. So if it's a donation related inquiry, it emails the team that um, handles donations. If it's a um, partnership inquiry, it goes to the team that enrolls partners. If it's a request for assistance, that's, you know, a really important one. We want to quickly elevate that 
because a lot of times the requests are pretty urgent. Um, so that goes to our programs team. You know, so I, I think that um, we're able to track that in our main customer service um, portal. Uh, and then, you know, each day or several times a week, um, I'll look through the conversations to make sure that people are, um, you know, kind of getting what they need. And then if there are errors or if it's tonally off, I'll be able to go in and update it. Um, but yeah, we just kind of, for, for us, you know, it's about a smooth experience um, and making sure that people don't get frustrated or there aren't any kind of inf infinite loops that cause somebody to, you know, leave that sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah that's super important, that. the, the user experience. Sorry, Ro, feel free to yeah, go no, ahead. Absolutely, and I think the features that auto populates the the spreadsheet is super useful mm -hmm. google prompt. sheets yeah, yes yeah the google sheets and and also the the email prompts and and i think that 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 i mean that goes to speak to how we can successfully engage with the user after they've engaged with the with the with the bot and so with with donations for example there's uh there's a very there's a small window and we like to refer to it as kind of the sweet spot. And so we need to be able to be very responsive uh, and, and the bot allows us to do that with those features. And I think that's really important. Raul, well, quick follow-up on that, you know, for other nonprofits watching what, uh, you know, I'm sure it varies based on, you know, the nonprofit and all that, but what is that like golden window? What's that time frame that, you know, you typically see people either donate or not? The maximum that we allow is 48 hours maximum. But we, we do have a call center uh, in-house and we also have an answering service that's 24 seven. Uh, but if we receive an inquiry, if it's within the business hours, uh, they will receive a call same day. And if it's after hours, um, obviously the bot gives them a prompt that we'll be in touch with them shortly, but it's in within 24 to 48 hours. And I think that 48 hour window that you mentioned is a perfect example of how nonprofits and you know anybody can also take advantage of our sequences feature, which allows you to right. you know follow up with a user in like a 24 hour window. So just a quick note on that. Um, going back a little bit, you know, now we're talking about results, but going back to kind of the drawing board here, um, and Tony, I'll ask this one of you. Um, what did like the planning phase, the planning stage of building the chatbot look like for you? Was it something where, you know, you collaborated with the team, you really mapped it out ahead of time? Was it something you kind of just built on the fly and then iterated as you went? Or what did that, you know, blueprint that process look like? Yeah, you know, I think that we started by looking at our website and try, because we have user flows mapped out for our website and we were able to trans that, translate that into the bot. And, you know, the more I worked with it, the more I thought, like, this is kind of the, the future. This is like a better version of a website because it directs people where they want to go. So, you know, it's um, we definitely narrowed the focus along the way. Um, we, you know, unlike a website, you're able to see what people are really interested in seeing and doing. Um, so we've narrowed it based on kind of the routes that people would take. But that's where we started. Um, not saying that that's where you should start. We knew nothing about this going in, but uh, yeah, that's where we started. That's cool. What about you, Ro? Yeah, so we uh, went through our inbox and we saw what were some, of, what are the majority of questions that are coming in uh, into our messenger, into our inbox. And so we were able to map out exactly how to answer those questions and uh, integrate that into the bot. So we were able to look exactly at what, what what are the questions that are being asked. And most of the time they were the same questions. Uh, and so we were able to map through there. So we created a flow chart. And then after that, we translated that into the bot. I actually think that's a very simple, but a very effective thing that a lot of people miss to do. I'm not talking about, you know, a moment where there's an emergency and you have to like have a solution right away, but like, it's a very important planning uh, stage that actually makes everything so much easier and so much smoother afterwards. Uh, we actually have a question for uh, Tony in the comments. Uh, the question is, let me just uh, find it. Drum yes, roll, what? <laughs> Drum roll, please. Yes. Uh, what does uh, Direct Relief use as their customer service platform? Uh, we use Zendesk. And we connect that with Sprout Social and Chat Fuel. Oh, so there's an entire flow there. Okay. 
And just out of curiosity, Tony, how are you connecting that? Is it through something more advanced like the JSON API, Zapier, conversation? Yeah, we do over? use the JSON API. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I don't know how advanced it is. It basically just creates a ticket in Zendesk um, and then routes and we're able to track uh, responses. For me, everything related to the JSON API is magic. Uh, yeah, me I have... too. I, don't, I really don't. I hope there are no follow-up questions to the JSON API. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So um, I guess this next one I'll ask of you, Raul. Um, you know, you just started building bots with ChatFuel, obviously, as we said, just a couple of weeks now. Um, in that short time period, what is something that you now know about chatbots and, you know, automation that you wish you knew when you were starting out? I know earlier you mentioned, you know, one of the things is, hey, you know, I don't need to know how to code. It's pretty simple. It's not, you know, anything super advanced, um, but maybe anything else that you wish you had known when you were first starting. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, obviously, response time is super critical. And so even in the short period of time, we did, we've been able to see just how uh, responding so quickly, we're able to nurture the user a lot more effectively. And so I think that um, even though it's it's common sense, if you will, that the faster you respond and, 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 and you know assist your users, you know, the better the experience it is. But to have instant responses, it changes things. And so we're able to take immediate action. And so I, I think that being able to see that you go from a two hour response window into an immediate response, I, it makes a very big difference. And what about uh, you, Tony? Um, yeah, I think going back, um, I probably would have started the way that Raul did with a flow chart <laughs> looking at your inbox, um, rather than taking a bunch of content and translate it into the bot. Um, and then also, you know, it, we didn't account for all the uh, all the variables of tone. So, you know, great exclamation point works well if somebody says I want to donate. But if somebody says, um, you know, I just broke my leg and I need some help, it's bad to say great exclamation oh. point. So, yeah, we learned along the way for sure. But then again, hindsight is 2020. So yeah. <laughs> definitely. And that's the beauty of bots and it being an iterative process. You learn yeah. as you go. Um, but one second, guys, I think I hear something. You guys hear that? That is the sound of recess. So stay tuned. We'll see you on the other side. Today's recess is sponsored by Bots for Good. Stay tuned. This marks the halfway point of today's episode of Chat Fuel School. So let's take a quick recess. Two is a number that makes everything better. Twice as many chocolate chip cookies. Twice as many golden retriever puppies. Twice as many days in the weekend. Twice as many random dance parties. And now, twice as many ChatFuel users. If you're a nonprofit, we'll double the number of users your chatbot can reach. That way, your nonprofit can help even more people in need. Double your impact today. Apply now to our Bots for Good program. So Andrew, I have to ask the first question uh, in, in, in this um, half. Um, how did you enjoy being Superman? Was it a nice experience? I must say it was quite enjoyable. It was really funny though. I was literally on my floor and I had a big fan in my face like blow my hair in the wind. So it was an unforgettable experience. Okay, would you do it again on a scale of one to 10? <laughs> uh, mm, I don't know, you'll have to stay tuned for next week's episode. Okay. Okay. Um, then we'll leave it as a surprise. Cool. Stay tuned. <laughs> so guys, we can um, keep going. Uh, can you tell me, like, we've been talking about, you know, what you wish you guys knew and stuff like that. Um, what is one tip, if you were talking to another nonprofit that is just getting started with this, what is the one tip that you would share with them to make their journey easier? Uh, perhaps we can start with Raul. Well, I think that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's just looking at how you can maximize uh, social media or Facebook in this instance uh, to further your cause and then finding ways to make sure that you 
are able to engage with users a lot more effectively. And I think that that chat fuel allows us to do that. And, and the value in that, um, especially in the current times that we're in right now, where everything is digital. I mean, you, you have to where people can't be in the same room in close proximities, limiting events and traditional fundraising is, is done at, at big events like that. And so being able to engage in social media space and being able to respond so quickly and be effective as a nonprofit immediately, I think that's that's relevant. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what about in your case, Tony? Um, yeah, you know, I, I would just, in order to scale, I think that we need to find solutions like this. I, I think that, you know, it's never too early to, or never too late to, to roll out a chat bot. I'm pretty sure that anyone's time could be, uh, leveraged if they if they do it um and i think that's what it really comes down to nonprofits need to uh, be as efficient as possible and this is just you know an easy way to do that tony in terms of scaling that you were just talking about um i know yesterday when we were chatting you know in advance uh you mentioned that again in terms of scale and direct relief really being this global international organization um you get questions from users from all over the world. And part of dealing with that is uh, multi-language support, multilingual support. Mm -hmm. And I know this is something that not only nonprofits often ask us about, but just people in general, they're like, you know, I have all these different users. How do I manage that? So I'm curious um, in your chat fuel experience, how are you managing the multilingual support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you know, we started off with a very simple bot, um, and when we kind of saw the proof in that use case, we realized it was worth an investment. So we worked with a developer um, who specializes in chatbots to help us, um, you know, kind of bring it to the to another level. Uh, and we one of the main priorities for us was multilingual support. So we connected um, the chat fuel bot to dialogue flow, which is um, Google uh, service, and that provides translation um, that we're then able to uh, respond to people's inquiries from all around the world. And that's been huge, especially as, you know, direct relief responds to emergencies all over the world and um, supports people in a number of languages. And I won't ask you anything about the JSON API or how that works. Or other languages, yeah. <laughs> no, dialogue flow, no. So we had um, a few weeks ago, we had an episode with uh, Josh Barkin from Janus AI. So for anyone who's interested, that's like a, a treasure trove of good content. Uh, so we have a question uh, again in the uh, chat that kind of intercepted a question I was going to ask either way. Uh, how has the pandemic changed things for, for nonprofits or how has it changed, you know, Things for um, you guys specifically. Yeah, and I can speak for um, for us specifically since, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have an in-house car auction. A lot of that took place live, and so we did have a component that was online bidding, but it wasn't really as big as it. It wasn't really our priority. We had bidders inside a bidding uh, inside a bidding room. And we had an auction bay and everybody's in close proximity. So COVID-19 uh, very heavily impacted that. And so uh, city regulations, state regulations uh, limited access. And in fact, they, they completely closed down the auction. And so we needed to find a way to be able to drive our online auction. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, Facebook was heavily our buyer uh, demographic or our buyer group. And so we figured that the best way that we can leverage that is by using this bot to allow us to engage in these auctions and then guiding and funneling these buyers into the online portal. And so it, it allowed us to do that and it's, it's helping us uh, expand and grow our online auction, uh, our, our online buyers. Yeah, well. Just a, a follow up there. Um, do you per perhaps have a comparison on how, of how the actual live um, auctions went, like the success versus the ones online? Is there a difference in, you know, um, conversions rates, the amounts of donations and similar things? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not going to, I don't have the exact numbers as far as increasing. Yeah, that's fine, of course. Uh, but I will tell you this, that it did open the door for new buyers uh, to be able to participate in the auction. And it has improved 
uh, the average price in which vehicles are selling because of the increase in, in, in bidders online. Oh, so wow. uh, because uh, we, we had, you know, just like any business, you have your repeat buyers and you have uh, a group that continues to participate. But because we did a heavy push to do this on, on social media, it allowed new, a new uh, group of buyers to be able to participate and therefore improve our auction numbers. That's actually great. It's interesting because I was talking to um, a yoga teacher from my uh, neighborhood who moved all her classes online since everything started and she's not planning to move them back uh, alive because all the participants are super happy. They can, you know, uh, uh, they can exercise home. They don't have to, you know, she doesn't have to pay rent and stuff like that. So I, I, I can see some changes coming, but I'm guessing that's a topic for uh, a different session of Chat Fuel School. Raul, quick follow up on that. And Tony, I, I know we haven't forgotten about you, but uh, just fascinated by this. Um, Raul, I know you said that, you know, you've gotten more, you know, bids, more people bidding, you're, you know, increasing the average sale or, you know, auction sale, for lack of a better word, of these vehicles. Um, have you actually gone through and like tracked if anybody who like entered this bidding portal through Chatfuel, if they ultimately like purchase the car? I'm just curious because I know, you know, we've been talking about like, yes, it's helped, but have you actually attributed any of the, you know, buyers to a chat fuel user yet? Excellent question. And we're on week three. And trust me, that's, that's my next phase. So uh, we definitely track how many buyers are Facebook buyers. Uh, so we have that information. We just have to find the best way to see we, which Facebook buyer was acquired through the bot and then compare that with the uh, database that we use for the auction database. And so uh, those are phases that we're, that we're working on. Uh, as of right now though, I, we, we, we don't track uh, bot acquisition with buyers. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, we are patiently waiting for that day when you can, uh, you can say that yes, a chat fuel user has uh, bought one of our vehicles and hopefully it's one of the Bentley limos. Um, Tony, question for you. Again, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, uh, what are some of the ways that you're driving traffic into the bot? We, you know, with, uh, we know as Raul has said, you know, he's using comment acquisition. Uh, what are the ways that you're using? You know, are you embedding the customer chat plugin on your website using comment acquisition? Um, what are the various ways that you're, you know, increasing and growing your, uh, your user base? Yeah, so at this point, you know, it's largely driven by external events. Um, we're seeing a huge uptick in inquiries simply from uh, kind of the, the news landscape and just the fact that we're responding to the largest crisis you know, we've ever dealt with. Um, so yeah, acquisition really isn't um, a priority right now. It's kind of meeting the expectations and answering the questions of people who do, do come through. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, so yeah, like you said, there's already a demand coming to you. It's not like yeah. you really need to promote it, but, um, but again, are you, so is it like solely all coming organically through like just people clicking send message on Facebook or do you have it on your website too? Or yeah, what's that so look send like? message right now. Um, you know, we have uh, experimented with adding it to our website. And I think um, that's something that we'd really like to do. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that it works for all users, um, you know, logged in or not. Yeah, absolutely. So let's kind of take a step back from uh, chatbots and messenger and all those things. Uh, what do you guys think? Because you're there every day, that is something you're living, you're going through and the challenges you're facing. What do you think is the biggest challenge for um, nonprofits on social media and in online marketing today in general? Wow, Raul, you want to take that one? <laughs> Just a small question. <laughs> Just a small, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can speak for for cost for kids. So as I mentioned, there's three components that we run and, and we're, we're juggling with. So we have the the donation aspect of the organization, which is important. We have the auction and we have a consignment portion of it. And all of these are also supporting schools. And so one of the things that we face is being able to balance all these different aspects of the business and not just focusing on one uh, specific arm of the organization. So we can't just focus on donations because auction is, is equally important. 
uh, we can't just focus on the auctions and donations because the schools are also important. And so I think that as, as a marketer, it's important that you uh, prioritize accordingly and you are able to put, place resources where you see are, are needed and, and be also be flexible, um, especially for a nonprofit and for us specifically, uh, because we have to maintain that balance. And so um, we do have a camp campaigns that are driven for donors. And we also have a specific campaign that we do for buyers as well. And so having those equally balanced out is important. So at work, what you do is you juggle pretty much. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Um, what about you, Tony? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think it's kind of different for different nonprofits. If you're a local group, it's going to be different than if you kind of have a, a global presence. And, you know, in Direct Relief's case also, um, interest in our organization is typically driven by external events that um, get a lot of news coverage. So when something... Um, you know, when there's some sort of crisis in the world, uh, typically direct relief is involved. Um, and there are also a lot of people who care about it and want to make a difference and, you know, find direct relief as a uh, kind of avenue to do so. Um, when it comes to social media and, well, just across the board for direct relief and organizations like direct relief, I, I think that, you know, in a way, the future of um, philanthropy is really cu good customer service because people find you um and then all you have to do is you know and and they find direct relief not because we're good at marketing but because of the work that we do uh and i think that's true of all nonprofits or any business i mean the best way to sell a product is to make a good product and the best way to um you, you know have a successful charity is to do great work um so when it comes to the chat bot you know i really see that as an extension of this idea that um, basically do the work, tell people about it. And, you know, fortunately, there are a lot of people who care about um, the issues that we respond to. And, and so in a way, that makes it pretty easy uh, for direct relief. Tony, another follow up on that, you know, you're talking about all the great work direct relief is doing, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, we're talking a lot about chatbots and the technical stuff and all that, but, you know, looking bigger picture here, what, uh, you know, are there any specific like stories you can share about how the bot has actually, you know, impacted someone, let's say somebody reached out for help and, you know, somehow the bot facilitated that process and, you know, you know, save their life or, you know, it doesn't have to be life-saving, but just yeah. you know, how is the bot, you know, actually help people in a tangible way? Um, yeah. So there's so many examples of this actually, where an organization somewhere in the world will reach out during an emergency um, because they need assistance and will be able to respond. And I think the most recent one actually, um, so Unilever and Dove, they have this uh, marketing campaign where they're kind of highlighting the courage of health workers and supporting direct relief. Um, and someone saw this commercial and they reached out to direct relief. It was the clinic in Louisiana, I believe, um, and said, you know, I saw the commercial, we need soap. We're out of soap. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily think of something like soap as being needed by a, a health clinic. Um, but you know, I think the shelves were stocked out. This was early in the pandemic and it just so happened that direct relief had a, a stockpile of, um, cleaning products that we were able to send like two days later. Um, and that was elevated by the bot, you know, it was, uh, landed in the right person's mailbox and, and we were able to respond. And, you know, that happens every week, I think through Facebook. So it, it really, is, um, it, it's wonderful that, that it's immediate, that it works well. Um, yeah, no, the bot has facilitated a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Amazing, amazing. And yeah, as uh, as we know now, you know, soap and cleaning products are like liquid gold. So it's amazing that uh, that the bot could help facilitate that. And obviously, again, a, a testament of the great work that Direct Relief is doing. Um, Raul, any, you know, heartwarming stories on, on your side of how the bot has really made a difference? I know mostly it's, you know, auctioning off the vehicles, but if you have anything to add. Well, I mean, I think we're very early on <laughs> in the implementation, but um, I, I well, when you I, look at the results that you shared with us, you wouldn't say that you were so early <laughs> with the implementation. So yes, really kudos for that. Yes, and uh, we're, we're ex extremely excited about that. And so we look forward to more, but um, I, I, I have no doubt in my mind we'll have something to share maybe in the future. 
Um, and and it's great to see that, you know, for organizations like Direct Relief, it's it's doing excellent. So. So what do you guys think? I mean, we've been talking about how these are technically business tools, you know, that we would expect only um, for profit organizations to use. Uh, but you're also on a market and you have to bid for people's attention. Um, so how does a nonprofit stand out and, uh, you know, focus on the donors and actually attract donors and volunteers and all the people it actually needs? Um. Yeah, I mean, I'll take that one. I, you know, I think that oftentimes the mission and the function of charities get confused. Um, you know, functionally, any organization is just like, should, ju you know, kind of use the same tools as a business, should hold themselves to the same standards um, that a business holds themselves to, uh, you know, in terms of um, serving their customers. And in a way, a charity has to even be better at it because at the end of the day, what you're giving someone isn't a product. You know, like if, if you're a business and you sell a bad cup of coffee, the customer can say, um, yeah, I'm not going back. It's not worth it. With a charity, um, the person who pays for the work isn't the person who necessarily benefits from it. And so what they're getting is not the benefit of your work, but really the report of what uh, their money's done and the experience of um, making a donation and engaging with your organization. So in a way, you know, a charity, the product that it sells is its um, relationship and the feeling that someone gets when they participate, when they donate, when they volunteer. Um, so yeah, I would say that, you know, it's really important for nonprofits to think about that and to look to businesses, which often lead the way when it comes to technology. Um, but, you know, they shouldn't lead that far ahead, I think. Yeah, actually, yeah. To support, Sorry. <laughs> to support that and something that Tony said earlier on, it's just the future of nonprofits. It really is customer service and nonprofits and charities really are only as strong as their supporters and, and their, and, and the supporters and donors are the backbones of nonprofits and, in, and, and the bot really helps navigate that in a way where customers are taken care of uh, almost, or if not instantly. And I think that, every nonprofit and every business should consider that. I mean, that's just the importance of social media is nurturing those relationships in cyberspace and making sure that they feel like, not, they're, not that they're only valued because they donated, but also if you're rendering a service that you're also uh, validating why they're supporting your nonprofit and doing it in, a, in, in, an, in an immediate way, the bot can, can help do that. And I think that's critical. Those are like amazing points. And I especially like the function and the mission and how they can, you know, get um, mixed up sometimes. Actually, uh, uh, you know, I was thinking the whole time as you were talking uh, how much I look forward to getting emails from an organization I donate to every month uh, that's uh, donating uh, meals for kids. And every month they send you, you know, how many kids exactly uh, were fed, you know, with that um, donation. So yeah, definitely, that's a huge, huge impact. And it's a small thing, you know, I get one email um, from them per month and it, it makes my day every time. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah, so uh, Raul, you were mentioning just briefly there kind of the future of nonprofits and what that might look like. So we have a clip here that I wanna play in just a second um, because yesterday Facebook announced how it's kind of rebranding this digital wallet that will eventually be implemented in Messenger. It's called Novi. Um, and I think it's a great way looking forward um, for nonprofits to you know, capture donations in a much more frictionless way through Messenger and other apps as well. Andrew, so, I think we need a breaking news banner across the do, screen we now. Do. <laughs> I know, I need like flashing lights. Um, so we're gonna go to that clip and then we'll get your guys' reaction on the other side.
I don't know about you guys, but that song just like makes me want to bust out and dance. But anyway, uh, Raul, I guess I'll get your quick reaction first and then we'll go to Tony and then wrap things up here. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. So, you know, so far, and this is something that, you know, Tony and I just men mentioned earlier on before uh, the school is just that, you know, Facebook has already integrated a uh, fundraiser component uh, on Facebook. And so, um, having something on Facebook and on the platform that it will allow users to uh, donate more seamlessly. It just seems like, you know, the future of nonprofits. I mean, we've seen success in, especially on the school side uh, where uh, we have teachers and we have administrators, students doing fundraisers for their schools using the Facebook platform I mean, it, it, it only makes sense for Facebook to make it more seamless and more user friendly and easier to be able to uh, donate via uh, social media or via Facebook. So, um, yeah, and the fact that it's in Messenger is, well, will be in Messenger in the future, super exciting. But Tony, thoughts? Yeah, no, I think it's incredible. Um, you know, we're really seeing kind of this disaggregation of a centralized place for payments, but also information. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the only place you could make a donation to a charity was on that charity's website. And now there are dozens of platforms and where you can do this, um, including mobile platforms. And Facebook was what um, actually has gone the furthest of, I think, any company in waiving its processing fees. So if you donate via Facebook, $1, $1 gets the charity. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize the processing fees um, associated with donations are the same as with products where it's, you know, a couple percentage points plus a, you know, a couple cents um, per donation. So having that 0%, just, you know, dollar in, dollar out um, policy has been huge for nonprofits. It saved, um, you know, I have no, no idea how much, but I would imagine quite a bit. Um, and I love the idea that, you know, this is going to be a new way to do it uh, from Messenger. It's going to open it up to people in the, across borders, which I think is also a really important thing. Um, and hopefully, you know, facilitate donations of small amounts, which you know, are really important. I mean, the, the, um, what a small donation from somebody who doesn't have a lot signifies is just as much as a big donation from somebody ha who has a lot. So uh, yeah, I think mobile payments um, through a digital wallet is gonna be a good thing. And one thing to know is that currently Facebook pay is only allowed between users and not user and, and uh, business. So I think that removing that barrier will also help nonprofits significantly, especially if you have, uh, you know, a brick and mortar of some sort. And, and, and in our example, I mean, imagine paying for a vehicle that you auctioned off via Facebook. And as Yelena said earlier, you know, all those, you know, fees that you don't have to pay, those are more kids that can be fed, more cars that can be sold, um, you know, more kids that can be helped and, and all that. Yes, it compounds definitely, even if it's just like a small processing fee. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, so we've been so good throughout the session answering questions from the chat and our team has also been uh, picking them up. So we've managed to answer all the questions. I can tell you that there has been some excitement about the acquisition from comments and that tool. Uh, so it seems like there will be some new people uh, testing it out. Uh, thank you, uh, Roel and Tony, so much for sharing the insight and for being uh, with us. I always want to say tonight because it's almost 9 p.m. here, but I know it's uh, morning and day for most of you guys. Blue skies. Blue skies. Yes, look at those blue skies, please. Um, so uh, before uh, we uh, sign off, we would just like to share a few key takeaways from what we've been talking about today. Yes. So these are our notes from Chat Fuel School. You know, maybe you missed class today or you fell asleep. Hopefully you didn't fall asleep. But either way, these are just three quick points of recap that should be useful in your bot building journey. So the first one, as Yelena just mentioned, try comment acquisition. Raul's using it. He's getting amazing results. So try that out. It's located in the Grow tab in the dashboard in case you don't know where that is. Second, bot building is an iterative process. It's not just a one and done type situation. You want to keep improving it as you go. Um, you know, as we heard from Tony earlier, he's had the bot for three years now. He's been using ChatFuel for a while, but it's not just a static process where you set it and forget it. 
And then finally, it is never too late to build a chatbot. Um, again, using Tony as an example, he had this bot build many years ago, um, but now it's relevant yet again, and uh, it's being used for good. So uh, thank you both for uh, joining us today. And before we go, Yelena has uh, an announcement for next week. Yes, there's actually a heated discussion about Facebook and nonprofit payments and everything uh, in our comments. So I think we've kind of encouraged people um, to think about these things, which is awesome. Yes, for uh, next week, uh, our topic is actually going to be very interesting. Uh, summer is coming up, summer 2020. I think we can all see it's going to be a little different than uh, what we are used to, the sun and the beaches. Um, so that doesn't mean your e-commerce store has to suffer. Uh, next week, we're going to bring in uh, e-commerce experts who are going to be talking about how to prepare uh, your store for the summer season and all those important dates like the 4th of July. It's going to be very actionable. It's going to be very cool. And don't miss it. Don't miss it. That's right. So the link is on screen. It's also available in the YouTube description below. So go ahead and click on that to get your reminder. But again, thank you, Raul and Tony, for joining us. And be sure to join us, everybody who's watching next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Chat Fuel School. Thanks for attending class today at Chat Fuel School. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for even more actionable educational content. And don't miss out on next week's class. Click the link below in the YouTube description to get a reminder as soon as we go live. We'll see you again next Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Happy botting.